Spurgeon amazes me in so many ways of the style of conversation that they seem to have had in those days. Seemingly the wisdom that God inspired men of God with, that I enjoy it. I enjoy God speaking to me through it. I enjoy God using me in it. I enjoy God doing with me what he would do today by sharing with me what he would say. Isn't that what he does with you? <laughs> or are you just watching this in order to make sure that I'm going to make sure that guy does it. You know, make sure he reads his devotionals. That was our agreement. <laughs> Art thou become like unto us, Isaiah? What must be the apostate professor's doom when his naked soul appears before God? How will he bear that voice? Depart ye, cursed. Thou hast rejected me, and I reject thee. Thou hast played the harlot and departed from me. I also have banished thee forever from my presence, and will not have any mercy upon thee. What will be this wretched shame at the last great day, when before assembled multitudes the apostate shall be unmasked? See the profane and sinners who never professed religion, lifting themselves up from their beds of fire to point at him. There he is, says one. Will he preach the gospel in hell? There he is, says another. He rebuked me for cursing, but was a hypocrite himself. Aha, says another. Here comes a psalm singing. One who has always at his meeting declared that he was best. Here is the man who boasted of his being sure of everlasting life, and here he is. No greater eagerness will ever be seen among the satanic tormentors than in that day when devils drag the hypocrite soul down to perdition. Bunyan pictures this with massive but awful grandeur of poetry when he speaks of the back way to hell. Seven devils bound the wretch with nine cords and dragged him from the road to heaven, which in which he professed to walk and thrust him through the back door into hell. Mind that back way to hell, professors. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Look well to your state. See whether you be in Christ or not. It is the easiest thing in the world to give a lenient verdict when oneself is to be tried. But oh, be just and true here. Be just to all, but be rigorous to yourself. Remember, if it be not a rock on which you build, when the house shall fall, great will be the fall of it. Oh, may the Lord give you sincerity, constancy, and firmness, and in no day, however evil, may you be led to turn aside. You know, I could see that on that day, Spurgeon had much that he was dealing with in the sense of there were those who appeared a form of godliness and very religious fervor and zeal, and yet, in his mind's eye, they were the ones that seemed to have been not what they profess to be. I love this whole ancient writings of hell as the Greeks portrayed it with the river, you know, and Spix and, you know, the dogs of hell and the ideas that men have created. And even Bunyan and Christians, when we've created these seven levels or, you know, 12 layers or, you know, nine chords or any of those things that aren't Christian. I mean, they're, they're Christian, but they're not accurate. They're just an idea that someone had that says, oh, you know, let's make hell worse than what it is, and let's just use, you know, our imagination to create this back door, you know, to hell. The bottom line is, God's explained hell very clearly. He explained it very distinctly. He recorded what's going to happen in heaven. He showed how it occurs, and he shows what occurs. You aren't going to have your buddies or your tormentors there in hell. That occurred in the pit, as during the time of torment, that they were tormented day and night until they were cast into the lake of fire. And there, they are tormented constantly by, really, the absence of God. And it is a lake of fire, but you're not going to know that there are people there. You're not going to be, you know, somehow masochistically enjoying your suffering. No. Hell is a place of absolute, utter abandonment and torment and burning and judgment of God. And that can happen being 
unholy in the presence of holiness. It can torment you. It can drive you nuts, so to speak. Only it's so much worse that you who were created for heaven find yourself in hell. So for the Christian that honestly just humbly seeks the Lord, there is no fear of hell. There's no terror of, oh my God, am I following the right Jesus or the right Christ or the right whatever? Jesus said it himself, call upon me and you shall be saved. But those that deny hell, that deny that there is judgment, that even deny Jesus himself, yes, there is a hell that has been set aside and has been designed not for those who were in rebellion of mankind, but was designed for the angels in heaven that rebelled against God and lost their first estate. And all those that participate in that rebellion that still is abounding in the world will wind up with those that rebelled. Do you really want to go there? You don't have to. It was never intended for you. But salvation has been given so that every man could come to the Lord. There's no big deception out there that's trying to stop you from going to heaven. You just need to call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. You just need to ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. You just need to call and, and tell God what you want that you desire, that you choose, and as you read his word, you'll understand the choices you're making. Because Jesus explained it very simply. He put it very childlike in the way to understand it. All you need to do is follow what he says to do, and there you are. You will be with Jesus living inside you in heaven forever and ever. And when you don't do those things, when you choose not to, when you go the opposite direction of what God is telling you to do, that is rebellion. Don't do it. It's that simple. If you're selfish and you think that you need to repent, repent. If you're carnal and you need to get your life together, get it together. It is the end of the world. It's coming soon. You will see it. It will happen to you. Death will you be knocking at your door in the next turn of the street if you're driving on the road or the next turn of time if you're walking on the byways or the next moment you may have an aneurysm or a heart attack or there may be a catastrophe or you may live in a foreign country that you're being persecuted and this time God may allow you to die. But since we do not know the day or the hour of our death, Likewise, in so manner, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know that we live in the latter days. We know that we're at the end of the age. We know that these end times are coming to a conclusion soon, and we will see Jesus. So, for those whom God has promised that he would take them into heaven, for they have filled their lives with love and peace and joy and seek to follow him, and they have read the book of Revelation and have determined that one of those churches God was sparing from the great tribulation, then do that. How simple can it be? If Jesus is the one who determines whom the Father will call and bring into heaven for a rapture or snatching away, then read what Jesus said and do it. But the bottom line is if you don't do it, God will make you into a vessel of wrath. And the saddest thing I can imagine, the saddest, most devastating the thing that takes away even my, my great smiling joy and goofiness sometimes is to just imagine one, not a hundred, one, and I mean one soul, even just one soul that should not be in hell that we could have in some way, somehow, some means stopped from making the choice to not learn of God, to not know Jesus. How dare we, if we are encouraging others to die without God, knowing full well that they're going to hell. I can't abide by that, can you? Are you prepared to make the decision for someone's eternal salvation? or eternal damnation? I'm not. God is.
let us follow hard after God's own heart that we might be merciful and tender considering the times we live in and be sober minded knowing that if one soul goes to hell it's one soul too many